Good morning. Hey, when it comes to restaurants, when it comes to movies, when it comes to hotels, celebrities, politicians, athletes, when it comes to all those people, all those things, we often allow, we often allow the experience and opinion of others to shape our perceptions of them, okay? So we allow other people what they think, we allow their opinions, their preferences to shape what we believe and what we think about so many things. Just, just a few examples here in, in my life here locally. There was a restaurant that opened up not too long ago. And I remember before I even went to this restaurant, hearing things from people. Now, I'm not gonna tell you if it was good or it was bad. My guess is when I, when I said it was a local restaurant that opened up, you may have even, yeah, I remember of, of a restaurant. Maybe there was a couple here recently that have, that have opened and you've been like, I've heard things about them. I've heard they're great. I've heard they're not so great. But when you hear those things from other people, you allow their thoughts, their ideas, their perceptions to shape and form yours. So it's not just restaurants, but also there's a new movie that just came out recently and I was jazzed up to go see it. We, we were talking about it. We'd see the previews on television. We're like, man, that, that movie looks good. It looks great. I want to go see that thing. And it was just in passing. Just in passing, I heard something. I don't even remember if it was someone in person or if I heard something on the radio but it was somewhat negative about the movie. It was like the, the movie didn't meet up to expectations to what, to what people thought it was gonna be. And so automatically through hearing that information, I'm like, oh, oh, maybe that movie isn't that good. Maybe I ought to wait till it comes out on DVD. Maybe I shouldn't go spend $75 on the movie and popcorn and juji fruits. But we allow, we allow the thoughts of others to shape and form our perception. My guess is, my guess is that you're probably fed up with the radio and TV of, of all that we hear when we turn on the television and hear about the political landscape and everything that's going on. And some of us, some of us are pretty well set in our political views, and it's not what we're here to talk about this morning. But when you hear things, when new information comes out, whether it's from, from a trusted source, whether it's from someone that you may not even know, that information that you hear can help. It may not change your decision. It may not make you, oh, well, I'm gonna change my vote. I'm not voting for them. I'm gonna vote for them because I heard this. But the opinions and perceptions of others and what we hear, it changes the way we think. It changes the way we view all types of things because we are constantly, constantly being bombarded with information from all different types. You get in the car, you turn the radio on. If any of you are like me, a lot of times I will, I will listen to talk radio. Sometimes it's sports radio, sometimes it's other types of talk radio, and they are constantly giving you their opinion of, of maybe yesterday's news or what's happened in that day. And when you hear that, when you absorb that, when you take that information in, it can affect what you believe and what you don't believe television, you turn the TV on and you hear reporters, you hear journalists, you hear them sharing the news of the day, you hear them, we, we hope that, that it's non-biased journalism, right? But, but most of us know that, that it's not, it's, it's slanted one way or another and you hear part of their opinion when they share the news and it has an impact on what we believe, what we don't believe. Magazines, you, you just glance at a magazine, you look at the cover of that magazine and whether it's the cover page, the title, the picture, it communicates something to us and it can have an impact on, on our thoughts, our opinions, our perceptions. Billboards, 
Billboards, when you drive down the road, you just glance at one, right? I mean, they're, they're in the business to catch your eye, to catch your attention. And they want to communicate something. They want to sell you a product or maybe their services. And so it begins to form opinions in your mind. How about newspapers? Does anybody still read newspapers? I know there's some of us who do. I don't get the newspaper, but there's some of us every morning whether it's the U.S. Today, today, whether it's the local paper, but they read the newspaper and, and you get all kinds of information from the newspapers. All of us, I shouldn't say all of us, because I know that there are some holdouts, but many of us, many of us get flooded each and every day from media outlets, from some type of online media. We get flooded with pictures, with stories, with news, with quotes, with recipes, right? We get all of that kind of stuff flooded in our social media outlets each and every day. So whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, whether we appreciate it or not, our opinions and our perceptions are constantly being influenced by the information that we see and we hear. Did you know that there are groups out there who, who make money, they profit by dedicating themselves to helping others form, form perceptions and, and opinions of others? I don't know that I said that right. There are businesses out there that specialize in reputation management. You, me, I could call several companies. I couldn't believe how many I found when I looked online. I could make a phone call and I could hire someone that can help me manage my reputation. I don't know if you knew that or not. There are companies out there that, that do that. They help businesses, they help individuals to manage their reputation. So companies, so companies can have a positive brand image and be more profitable. So, so restaurants can appear to have, have received rave reviews so that they receive more business in through their doors. So, so the considerate, caring, and charitable side of athletes are portrayed in the media to improve and increase their merchandising, their net worth, and their future contracts. So, so politicians, so they can understand what's most popular with their constituents, ensuring the best possible outcome when it comes to election day. These groups, these groups that help all of these people and these companies, they shape and form opinions and perceptions. Sometimes it's legit, sometimes it's not so legit. But you and, and I, we're left wondering, is that really truth or is it trash? Are we really seeing the truth or are we seeing something that's been cooked, that's been connived, that's been made up, that's somewhat artificial? And if, if you're like me today, I, I wanna see authenticity today. I wanna see real life stuff. I don't wanna see something that's been created something that, that, that someone has helped guide someone. To, this is what you need to say. This is what you need to wear. This is how you need to act. This is who you need to hang around with so that people think that you are something that you possibly might not be. But it's not always malicious. It's not always connived. Sometimes that we, we do things. Sometimes we endorse people. Sometimes we purchase products cheer on sports teams because there have been people in our lives who have been influential. They've helped shape our perceptions and our opinions of so many things. Here are just a few examples in my life. I own a simplicity lawnmower. And it just so happens that my grandpa owns a simplicity lawnmower. And it just so happens that he believes and I believe that simplicity lawnmowers are the best lawnmowers out there, 
right? They've got those wheels on the back of the deck and they help stripe the lawn, American made product, right? I'm trying to sell you all of you. When you leave here today, you're gonna think, oh, Simplicity, they're the greatest lawn mowers ever. No, because I know some of you out there, you've got differing opinions. You may think that there are other lawn mowers out there that are just the best. And some of you are sitting out there saying, I could care less. I don't care about lawn mowers. I don't mow the lawn. I don't even know what color simplicity lawn mowers are. They're orange. <laughs> but whatever you think, you think it for a reason. Whatever you think about lawn mowers, whether you've got a strong opinion or you have no opinion, you think that for a reason. Cheez Its. They happen to be orange too. They're a favorite snack of mine. I want to say they're my favorite snack, but my favorite snack is whatever is available in the house. But Cheez Its are one of my favorite snacks. And growing up, guess what? My grandpa always had Cheez Its at the house. It was the first time I ever was exposed to the goodness and the wonderfulness of Cheez Its. The grooves are amazing if you've never had them. Just recently came out with those. My guess is you have a favorite snack. I'm probably not gonna convince you that Cheez-Its are better than your favorite snack, but you believe that for a reason. There's a reason why you think what you do about your favorite snack. In my house, the towels get folded a certain way. It's not by chance. It just so happens that when I go to my in-law's house, they fold the towels the exact same way that my wife has trained my son now to fold the towels. But it's fun every now and then. It doesn't happen very often because I want to make sure that my, my children have the opportunity to get, you know, to learn how to do chores. But it's fun every now and then to fold the towels a different way and stuff them in the closet and shut the door and see what happens, right? It's like the house is gonna fall apart because we folded the towels a different way. You fold the towels the way you do for a reason. And in, in our house, it's because that's the way my mother-in-law fold. She folded the towels and how my wife was trained as she grew up. This is how you fold the towels. So, that's how we fold them in our house. But here's the point this morning is all of us to some extent, all of us have allowed others to shape our view of the world. We've allowed others to shape our view of culture, of money, of politics, of athletics, of, of so many things. We've allowed others to shape our view for the conversation today, we've allowed others to shape our view of God, of faith, and of Christianity. And sometimes it's the truth, but sometimes it's just trash, and we need to call it that. My guess is, as many of you here this morning, that you have experienced this. You've had to, you've had to field questions, spiritual in nature, because others have grown up believing a certain thing, or, or maybe they, they believe a certain way that's just different than the way you believed it because of what they grew up hearing, maybe from parents, maybe from a teacher, from someone influential in their lives. Oftentimes, it could be a passage of scripture that, that they've maybe taken out of context, or, or quite possibly, it's, it's when someone brings their worldview in and finds somewhere in God's word a piece, a snippet of scripture and says, yeah, that's truth because I believe it, because I want it to be truth, because it fits within my worldview. There is a pastor from, from Atlanta, Georgia, his name's Dan Ryland, and this week he tweeted this. He said, we all tend to see what we're looking for, not necessarily what is true. We all tend to see what we're looking for, not necessarily what is true. We, we come to so much with our worldview. 
And it's because of things we've heard, it's because of things we've seen, and it shapes our opinions and perceptions. So how do we know when it comes to spiritual things, the things that are, that are of, of, of the utmost importance, how do we know if these things are truth or if they're trash? Things like a godly home guarantees godly children. How do we know if that's truth or that's trash? Because for some of us, that can be comforting. We, we, we want to believe that. We want to claim that. We, we want to know that that's true because maybe we have, we've had the opportunity to raise our kids in a godly home and they just recently went out into the world on their own. And we want to claim that and say, I raised them in a godly way. They're going to be godly kids. We want that to be true. For some of us, maybe we're getting, we're getting into this church thing and into this relationship with Christ thing late in life and maybe we didn't raise our kids in a godly home. And so for some of us, maybe that's not what we wanna believe because we didn't have the opportunity to shape and form our kids during those, those precious years of their lives. What do you think? Is it truth or is it trash? How about things like Christians shouldn't judge? The Christians shouldn't judge. This, this can help us, I think, as, as followers of Christ. I think, I think we, we want to believe this, whether it's truth or trash, we wanna believe this because I think it can get us off the hook so many times in a couple ways. One way, it's a struggle sometimes to know what, what's truth and what's trash. And so we see someone doing something and we think, I don't think that's right. I, I think I should say something because I think my brother in Christ, I think he's going down a wrong path. But if I say something, I might offend them. I may lose a friend. He may get upset with me. They may ask me to prove it in, the, in God's word. How do you know that to be true? And then we may have to have a deeper conversation, a longer conversation, a harder conversation. So I think it's easier for me just to stand on this. Let's say, well, it's, it's unbiblical for us to judge. We shouldn't judge. We'll just leave it up to God. God can take care of all of it in the end. And so we're left thinking, is that truth or is it trash? Maybe it's this. You, you, maybe you've heard this said, I've heard it said recently, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. And well, if, if by everything happens for a reason, we mean that God is this great puppet master and he orchestrates every single event in my life, every single event in your life, whether it's an act, a decision, a thought, a good deed, a sin, an accident, a natural disaster, that God orchestrates all of that. Maybe, maybe that's what you think. And so we then can, can chalk up things that happen to us, to others, and we can just say, well, everything happens for a reason. And even though I may not know what that reason is, God does. God knows, God knows the reason that that happened because everything happens for a reason. Sometimes we're not very good at explaining what the reason is. And so we're left with trying to figure out, is that truth or is it trash? What, what, about, what about if you don't share Jesus with someone and they don't get to heaven? And is, is, that responsibility lies on you. Is that truth or is that trash? Or maybe you've done too much in your life, you've gone too far, you've messed up too many times, you've sinned too much, you've done something so outlandish, so outrageous, so incredible that there's no hope for you today. Is that truth or is it trash? Well, the good thing this morning is, is that we're not gonna talk about any of those. We're not going to dig into any of those, but what we're going to talk about here this morning as we kick off this series, Truth or Trash, is this. Is this idea that God isn't interested in the small things of your life. That God isn't interested in the small things of your life. Is that truth or is it trash? 
Because you know God, he is a big God, right? He, he is pretty big. And, and typically, this topic comes up in, in Sunday school class, in children's church, in one of those kids' environments when someone asks the question, or better yet, when a kid asks a teacher the question, how big is God? He's pretty big, right? How big is he? And we start stuttering and stammering because we can't really explain and describe how big God is. How big is he? It's a tough one because we wanna answer it in quantifiable terms. We wanna somehow be able to, to compare how big God is with, with something else like, like, you know, the Statue of Liberty, it's big. God's like that, he's like that big. Or maybe you can compare it to something different, how big he is. Let's look at a couple passages of scripture. We're gonna look at Isaiah chapter 40, verses 25, 26, and 28. They're a little bit too long. I didn't put them on the screen. So if you'd like to grab one of the Bibles in the chair in front of you, uh, by all means, please do that. If you wanna use your electronic device, uh, you, you can do that as well. Um, we're gonna we're gonna work through these pretty quick though. We're gonna spend a lot of time on these verses. But Isaiah 40, 25, 26, and 28 says, to whom will you compare me? Who is my equal, asks the Holy One. Look up into the heavens, who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by name. I love that. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one, not a single star is missing. Remember, he knows them by name. Have you ever heard have you never, I'm sorry, have you never heard, have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He's a big God. He's got a lot going on, right? Psalm 8 verses 3 and 4 says, when I look at the night sky, and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you set in place. What are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. God's got a lot going on. He set the stars in place, right? He created all that we see. Isaiah 55 verses eight and nine goes like this. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. We're not even on the same plane with God, right? In, in trying to describe how big he is. But I think, I think we have I think we've got to dig a little bit deeper because my guess is, is many of you, many of you, when, when, I, when I shared the topic, this is what we're going to talk about today, whether it's truth or trash, whether God truly is concerned with the little things of your life or not. My guess is many of you, many of you just said, oh, well, yeah, of course, right? Of course, he's, he's aware of what's going in my life, even even the small things. He knows the big things in my life. He knows the small things that are going on in my lives, right? Or our lives, right? It's easy just to jump to that conclusion and that end result. Well, yes, God knows. Even though he's big, even though he's got a lot going on, even though he's, he's taken care of so much that we can't even comprehend or fathom. Yeah, God knows what's going on in my life, even the small things. But here's the deal is even I struggle with this idea. And, and here's why. Because I can't remember the little things. <laughs> I, I can't, it's easy for me. It's easy for me to overlook so many things and forget about them. It's, it's so easy for me to do that. I don't know why, but I have, this, I have this spiritual gift for remembering 
the dumbest, weirdest, craziest bits of information from years back. I can remember the silliest, stupidest, smallest things from years back. But I can't remember that I'm supposed to pick up my kid at school at 3.30 in the afternoon. I think there are some things in our lives that are a little bit more significant and a little bit more important. But I forget them. I forget the small things. There are things that I, I try to say to myself, oh, I'm going to remember that. I had this, this conversation with someone recently and it was something significant in their lives. And I walk away thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to remember that. I'm going to pray about them. I'm gonna follow back up with them. I'm gonna ask them, how, how, how are things going? And what happens? A week, two weeks later, you hear about that same person and what's going on and you go, ah, I forgot. I don't know, maybe it's only me. Maybe you guys don't struggle with that, but I so easily can forget the little things. So deep down, I think that this question, I think that this idea, this statement of, of God being concerned with the little things of our lives, I think that it's more of an indictment on us than it is on God. Because I think we, we can think that God thinks like us at times. And if I can't remember the small things, if I struggle with remembering the little things, that I think it's easy for us to lose sight of that and and think, well, well, maybe, maybe God does that too. Maybe some of the small things. God's got a lot of stuff going on in that side of the world. He's got crazy stuff going on in this side of the world. And and here I am in Indiana, in Whitley County, out on 400 South. And God is really concerned with the smallest bits and pieces of my life. It's so hard for us to believe to believe that because we are so easily distracted as people. We have so many screens in front of us at all times. It's hard to keep focused. We joke about this on Monday mornings in our staff meeting. We do get work done on Monday mornings at staff meeting. But as we're meeting and as we're having conversations, all of a sudden, all of a sudden these rabbits just come out of nowhere. They come out from under the couch and they come in from the doors and all of a sudden they're just these rabbit trail here and a rabbit trail here. And next thing you know, we see a squirrel and somebody yells, squirrel! And we've got to, oh yeah, yeah, well, we got to get back on track. We do that so often in our lives and we can relate that and think that maybe God isn't interested in the small things of our lives. When When my youngest child, when he was about this old, I'm gonna guess he was about 18 months. I don't don't remember the age, 18 months. Thank you, 18 months. He's a big kid, about 18 months old. We had a blue swimming pool. We had not not one of those hard plastic small things, one of them with the, the, the blow up rubber thing around the top of it. You know what I mean? You put the air in it, you start filling it up. And it, and it raises up and it kind of kind of does this number. We had one of those. And it was pretty cool for a while. My, my 18 month old son was out in the pool and it's only like, I don't know, it's not very deep, right? You can't get hurt in one of those pools. I'm standing right next to the pool and he's swimming away. And I don't know what happened. I got distracted. I, I, I'm looking somewhere else. But the next thing I know is I look down in the pool and all I can see are his eyes looking up at me from the bottom of the pool. He's underwater. He had slipped, he had fallen down because the bottom of those pools are slippery. He slipped and he fell down and he was, he was laying under the water like this. I swear he was looking right at me and I'm looking at him. It's like, what are you doing down there? Just get up. I mean, the water's only this deep, right? Just stand up is what I'm thinking. He couldn't stand up. But thank the Lord, my wife was 15 or 20 feet away. Remember, I'm standing right here. She got to him before I did. We can be, we cannot be very attentive, you know? 
we can get distracted so easily. And, and I'm guilty as charged. The point is, is that I wasn't very attentive and for so much of us, that's the case. That's the case in our lives, that we aren't very attentive and so we can just automatically think, God's not attentive to my life. Maybe he is to the big decisions. Maybe God's focused on, on me saying yes to him. But when it comes to, you know, what we've got to eat in the cupboards or maybe the clothes we wear or, or maybe some of the, the fringe things of our lives, I don't know, maybe God's not that focused on all aspects of my life. And for the, com for the sake of our conversation this morning and for the next few weeks, our practice is gonna to be to explore God's word to discover what it says about each one of these questions, each one of these statements. Because there are a lot of smart people around and you can get a lot of advice. Some of it good, some of it not so good. But we're gonna, we're gonna to stick to God's word and we're gonna see what it has to say this morning and for the next few weeks as we, as we continue on in this series, Truth or Trash. So even though, even though God says, uh, I'm sorry, even though that, that people say that God is too big at times and that he's got too much going on, do we believe, do we believe it's truth or trash that he's not concerned with our lives? It is absolutely trash. It, it, it's the biggest load of bunk ever that God isn't concerned with the small things of your life. As a matter of fact, flip to the next slide. God is absolutely attentive to every aspect of your life. Absolutely attentive to every aspect of your life. And that, my friends, that is the truth. Very quickly, we can, we can see this in the life of Jesus. He demonstrates God's care for the details of our lives. He, he demonstrated it so many, so many ways throughout the scriptures that we can read about him. We see him as he provides food for the 5,000, those who came and listened to him preach, right? God didn't just meet their spiritual need through, through teaching them the truth, but he also had concern and he cared that they were hungry, they, they had been there for a long time and they were hungry. And so God didn't just feed them spiritually. He fed them physically as well. Performed the miracle and, and, and over 5,000 were fed that day just on a few fish and a few chunks of bread. We, we see this in his interaction with children. Back in that day, children were, they were kind of pushed aside. They weren't real important. They were marginalized. And so as the children were, were coming to him and the, the, the adults were, stop, get away from Jesus. He's too important. He's got too much other stuff going on. No, Jesus says, let the children come to me. Don't stop them for the kingdom of heaven is theirs, right? God was concerned about even the little children. He took time. He took time with those that he healed I mean, people were, they would swarm Jesus. They were all around him. They were, there were just so many times when Jesus, if it were me, I'd have been overwhelmed at the number of people that were around me. But yet, but yet Jesus would take time with each of them and he would heal them, not just physically, but so often we read how Jesus didn't just heal physically, but he also healed spiritually, he healed emotionally, relationally. He healed people completely he wasn't just focused on what we might say are the big things in their lives. He was focused on every aspect of, of, the, of people's lives. He took time in the midst of his arrest. When he was being arrested by the soldiers and one of the disciples got crazy with his sword doing this ninja kung fu stuff and he cut the ear off of the high priest's servant, Jesus, Jesus cared enough about his enemy to pick the man's ear up and to put it back on his head and to heal him. I mean, if, if that doesn't show you to the great length and the detail at which God would go to care for someone, I don't, I don't know what would. Jesus cared for people while he was here on earth and through that it demonstrates God's 
love for us and how he was concerned even with the smallest aspects of our lives. If you would, turn to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. We're going to spend a little bit of time here this morning. Emily did such a better job reading it this morning than I probably will. Psalm 139. It says this. O Lord, you have examined my heart. He has examined our hearts. Not a fleeting glance, not a quick look. He has examined our hearts. And you know everything about me. There is nothing about you, there's nothing about me that God doesn't know because he has examined our hearts. You know when I sit and when I stand up. How inconsequential is that? I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna stand up. Is is that something that, that you think that someone ought to pay attention to in your life when you sit or when you stand? But yet God's word says he knows when you sit and when you stand. That's incredible. You know my thoughts even when I am far away. He knows what we're thinking. He knows what's going through your mind right now. He knows your thoughts from afar. You see me when I travel. When you're on vacation, when you go somewhere, when, when you head to Fort Wayne today, when you go to Lar, when you travel home, God sees you when you are traveling. Whether you're in the car, whether you're on a bike, whether you're walking, whatever you're doing, God sees you when you travel. And when I rest at home, when you lay your head down on the pillow, when, when you get home this afternoon and you have lunch, and you go get in the recliner or you lay down on the couch or maybe you just go straight to the bedroom because it's gonna be a good nap today. When you rest, God knows. He knows it, he sees you when you rest. It's not unimportant to him because God recognizes it and he sees it in your life when you rest. You know, he knows what we're gonna say before we say it. God goes before us, he comes after us. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. Skip down to verse 13. God made all the delicate inner parts of my body and he knit me together in my mother's womb. Now I don't crochet, I don't knit, but my grandmother did. And I can't imagine the repetition and the time and the effort that goes into knitting and crocheting. Some of us may think that's kind of mundane, that, that, that there's not much to it, but to stay persistent and to stay at it and as detailed as knitting and crocheting is, that picture in my mind that God knit me together, that he knit each and every one of us. He knit us together in our mother's womb. He took, he went to great lengths, great detail, to to form, to fashion each and every one of us. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me before I was born. So, so if there was ever a doubt in your mind this morning, whether God saw or God sees the small things of your life, whether God is concerned with the little things of your life, if you ever had a doubt before, it says that God saw you before you were even born. Before you were a baby, before you were an infant, before you were 18 months old, before you were older, God saw you before you were even born. God knows everything about you and about me. Everything, he knows it. Flip over to Luke 15. 
Luke 15. In this chapter, we can read about the stories of, of the lost sheep, the lost corner, the lost son. I'd like to focus just for a few minutes on the lost son. Some of you have heard this. Some of you, it's a familiar story of where the, the, there were two sons and the younger son asked the father, hey, I, I wish you were dead. It's really what it was saying. I wish you were dead because I want my share of the inheritance because I'm gone, I'm out of here. I don't care for you. I don't care for our family. I don't want to be around you anymore. I want out of here. And so just out of this incredible act of humility, the father agrees to it, splits up the inheritance and gives half to the younger son. The younger son takes off. The younger son goes to, to wherever he can go and he squanders everything his father had given him. Squandered it all. And he finally was able to find some work because a famine had hit the land. He found some work and he was working with pigs and it, he, he got so low in his life that he longed, he craved to eat the food that the pigs were eating because he had nothing. He was as low as he could get. And so he thinks to himself, even, even my father's servants, even they have food to eat, even they have a roof over their head, I, I'm gonna take a chance, I'm going back. Maybe my father will take me back, not as a son, but as a servant. And then verse 20, here, here's, what's, here's what's significant for this morning. It says, so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. How did his father see him coming? How did his father see him coming? Did, did, did he pay someone to, to stand at the entrance of the gate? Did he, stay, did he pay someone to, to stand out at the road at all, all hours of the night? Just, just thinking maybe the son's gonna return? You think he asked someone else to do it? I don't. He didn't. Because it's a picture of God and us. Because the father is God and we are this prodigal son returning home. And it's this picture of the father of finding himself on a regular basis, longing for the return of his son and going to whatever links he had to, wherever he had to go, wh whether he found the, the highest hill on his property, whether he went to the entrance of the gate of the, of the, the community in which he lived, wherever he went, he did it on a regular basis. He was consistent with it. He was persistent with it because he longed for his son to come home. And it's a picture of our heavenly father. When we think that he may not be concerned with, ever, with every aspect of our life, with the small things of our lives, and we look at this passage of scripture, there is no doubt in my mind that God is concerned with every, every little bit that's going on in your life, even so much that he'll be patient, that he'll be persistent, and that he will wait on you to return. Flip a couple pages back to Luke 12. God never gives up on us. God knows everything about me. In verse 22, it says, then turning to his disciples, Jesus said, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear. Verse 23, for life is more than food and your body more than clothing. For your life is more than food. God knows that your life is is more than food. Now, when we talk about food here, what I'm talking about is, is not necessarily um, food that we eat. It can be, absolutely. God is, God is, he is concerned with whether you have food to eat, whether you are nourished or whether you are not. But I believe here as Jesus is teaching, he's saying that life is more important than food. I believe that there are things in our lives 
that maybe hold higher significance. Because here's the thing, we can be well fed, we can be well nourished, we can have all the food that we need at home in the cupboard and not know Jesus. And is all the food in the world, is that gonna get you anywhere? Is that gonna help you out? If you don't know Jesus Christ, all the food in the world makes very little difference. And so even though God is concerned with the little things in your life and there's nothing that surprises him, there's nothing that he misses out on your life, there's never a time he doesn't see you, he doesn't think of you, he doesn't consider you, I do believe that there are things in your life as as mentioned here by Jesus that are more significant, that are more important that life is more than food, that life is more than clothing, that life is more than being happy. So so let me ask this morning, how, how is your life? How is your life? How is your relationship with Jesus Christ? You may, you may find yourself here this morning and you may say, well, I was invited here and, and I, I, don't, I don't attend church much. I don't know much about Jesus. I've, I've, heard, I've heard things about him. I know that there are people who, who follow Jesus, but, but I don't know if that's for me. I've got a lot of questions. They're just things that, that I need to have answered before, before I say yes to him and follow him. And if that's, if that's you, I'd encourage you to do that, I encourage you to take those next steps. If you've got questions that need answered before you make a major decision in your life, may I I implore you this morning that here in just a few minutes when we take up our offering, there's there's a perforated communicator card on the bottom of your bulletin. I'd ask you to tear that off and I'd ask you to fill that information out. If there's something big in your life that you need to make a decision on. Maybe it's not deciding on Jesus. Maybe it's something else. Maybe you believe in Jesus, but you know you haven't been living that way. You know that there are some things in your life that need to change. Maybe that's the next step in your life. But I'd ask you what or how is your life this morning? Because God is concerned with your life. The small things. The, the, the medium-sized things, the big things. I mean, really, when we get down to it, what's big in your life compared to God? What, what, what's big in our lives, really, in comparison to our Heavenly Father? I can tell you that his will for your life is that you would know him, that you would know him, that you would trust him, and that you would live out your life for him. I do know that. So as the ushers make their way uh, here this morning, I want to give you just a few moments to take out that communicator card, to fill it out. And if there's something going on in your life, really, I'd encourage you, write it down. And, And if you want someone to follow up with you, if you'd like to have a conversation with one of the pastors, with the leadership here at the church, we we would love to, we would love to make an appointment and sit down and chat with you. We'd love to, to help see you take that next step of faith, whatever that is for your life. Because I guarantee you, I know it based on the, the, the scriptures that we read, that, that as, much, as much as I want it for your life, as much as, as a pastor, one of the pastors here at church might want it for your life, God wants it more. God wants it more because he knows everything there is to know about you and about me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, quite honestly, it's a little overwhelming to think that you know all there is to know about me. It's hard to think that there's anybody that knows more about me than me, but you know more than that. You, You know the very number of hairs upon our head, You know us intimately, you know us uniquely. You know when we sit, when we stand, when we rest, when we go. You know all of those things about us. You know when we have plenty of food, you know when we are in need. But I also see in your word that it says that life is more important than food. And that if life is more important than food, then I believe 
I believe that there are some things that take precedence in our lives. And, and I think there's nothing that could be more important in our lives than to give them to Jesus and to trust in him and to follow him and to be aligned with the principles, the values, the behaviors of Jesus Christ. And if there, are, there is anyone here this morning that needs to make that decision, God, would you be with him? Would you help him? Would you send your Holy Spirit to minister to him? Maybe there's, maybe there's someone who, who just needs to take that next step, who, who believes in Jesus but has had trouble with maybe some sin in their lives, with making poor decisions, with, with, with going down a wrong path. Holy Spirit, would you, would you meet with them as well? Would you minister to them in ways that only you can? And will you provide the courage and the boldness to help them make that next decision? Knowing that, that your word says that you go before us, you you make a path and that you follow us, that you go behind as well. You are with us along the journey. There's just no greater joy than being in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.